Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. How do we break America's addiction to guns and gun violence? Today on The Laura Flanders Show, we talk with a young man who served 10 years in prison on a gun-related charge and hear from culture critic Jeff Chang about the cultural changes that have and haven't transformed America. All that and I consider a prison-free state. Welcome to our program. Marlon Peterson spent his entire 20s in prison, charged with second-degree murder and convicted of attempted robbery and assault. Five years after his release, he's now a Soros Foundation Justice Fellow, working to end gun violence and increase community safety in New York City through the creation of zones where no one will need to carry a gun not even police. He's designed and implemented several youth empowerment programs and earned an undergraduate degree from New York University. He's also become a published writer. Marlon's the co-founder of the Precedental Group, about which more. I'm ever so happy to welcome him to our program. Marlon, welcome to the show. Glad to have you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having so um, take us back to pre-prison Marlon. Introduce me to him. Who was he? What was his life like? What were his parents like? What was he up to? I hear a rumor of writing for Spike Lee and interning at the opera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting sort of story. So Brooklyn, New York, by way of Trinidad, I always put that out there. Um, grew up with parents, grew up as a Jehovah's Witness, actually. So I might have been knocking on your door at some <laughs> point <laughs> um, as a kid. So I learned, um, you know, speaking in front of people and groups at a young age, did very well in school, valedictorian of, uh, uh, of my grade school and things of that nature. Um, but I think I always say that during my early teens, there was a series of like very traumatic events that happened. Mm -hmm. um, one was very violent, well both were very violent in nature. Um, one was, was sexually violent in nature. And I think both of those sort of things, and just like, you know, everyday sort of bullying for being the smart guy in school, I think in my teenage sort of um, logic, I felt like the best way to sort of deal with these sort of things was to sort of like shift who I am and who I'm around. You know, I can't be this prey. I gotta sort of like, you know, be around other folks that's doing the praying. Um, so um, all that honor roll stuff sort of just trickled out quickly. Uh, not quickly, just phased out. Uh, so by the time I got into, um, I went to college actually in New York City Tech um, for a couple of semesters, didn't do well financial aid. I didn't know how to navigate that system, so I just dropped out. Mm. Um, and then um, after a couple of months of just like languishing, not doing much, just hanging around the neighborhood, hanging around the block, um, I decided to enroll in um, a technical school, Apex Technical School. I said, let me do something with myself. Mm -hmm. And um, it was about three months from graduating from it, just 12 days before my 20th birthday, um, when I was arrested um, in connection with a double homicide that happened in Lower Manhattan. Um, I was the youngest of five folks. Um, I was a lookout in the crime. And I was initially facing, it's funny, I was initially facing the death penalty. And I remember my lawyer saying to me, well, you know, Robert Morgenthau, who was a DA at the time, I had DA, well, he never faces, he never uh, pursues it, but he'll probably just pursue life without parole. <laughs> as if it was like, okay, that's good for Great me. Great option. <laughs> um, thankfully, that didn't happen. Yeah. Um, but I was sentenced to 12 years. And now you have numbers tattooed on your shoulder. Yeah, 10 to 7. That's the only tattoos I have. 10 years, 2 months, 7 days. Um, so out of the 12 years, I did 85% of that time, which is um, mandated through in New York State. Um, so I was released. I was went in when I was 19. I came out when I was 30, 31. You wrote in Gorka not so long ago that you spent a lot of time in prison, well, reading, learning, but also watching people become prisoners. What did you mean by that? It's a breaking down process. Um, I always remember uh, Angela Davis' book, and she had a quote that says, you know, prisons are, are in jail are designed to make people, um, like in the zoo, obedient to the mass, but dangerous to each other. Um, and inside of that space, there's nothing about the prison environment, I always say, that, that, that initiates, that encourages rehabilitation, empowerment, mm -hmm. none of those sort of things. People are able to do it in spite of the conditions of the prison system. So seeing folks... Um, whether they had, if they didn't have any family to visit or they had no one to call or no one to write, so they were definitely not getting any, uh, any letters or any visits. Um, it 
it isolates you in a way that's very inhuman. Um, and, and, and not to absolve people for whatever they have done to put them, to get them in that place, but the, the very space of it, um, in particular as a young, young person, when, when I was usually the young person in the space, in, in the different jails I was in or I was transferred to, there's nothing about it that unless you have a tremendous amount of sort of familial support mm -hmm. or if you have some rock, rock hard bedrock foundation on which to sort of build from, there's nothing there that's going to encourage mm -hmm. sort of a successful time or you want, if you want to say that a successful time in, mm -hmm. inside those places. Something made a difference for you, which was letter writing. How definitely, definitely. So, I'm, I mean, you mentioned earlier, I had, you know, my seventh grade teacher, you know, discovered I had a good writing ability. So I had an internship uh, where I wrote for, uh, for the Fort Greene News in Brooklyn, sponsored through Spike Lee and Nike. Um, and I sort of rekindled that ability and that talent while I was inside. So it started with me just writing to myself. So at this stand, I have like a huge library of, of journals from day one to, to the last day I was released on December 23rd, 2009. Um, but in that also, I was able to participate and create or co-create a program um, through a friend of mine at the time. She was a teacher at the time in Brooklyn and uh, just writing to her kids. Mm. And it became just asking her asking me to write one letter, just some words of wisdom, speaking about my experience. And it became a program um, where I would create lesson plans for the kids and she would implement it and they would each individually write me back and I would individually write every one of those kids back up to 50 letters every two weeks. Um, and I often say that, that that helped me more so than, I don't even know, but I think it helped me more so than even helped these young folks, even though they told me so many deep yeah. things about them, even though they never met me. Um, it gave me a sense of relevancy, a sense of purpose, um, despite those places, and a sense of like, I can be something, I'm a human being, yeah. despite everything that this place I'm in is telling me. Well, now you're a Soros Justice Fellow. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Just recently announced. And you're working on this program around gun violence. Um, of all the possible things you could work on, why, why gun violence at the center? Well, so I'm from Crown Heights, Brooklyn, right? So, you know, I grew up in the late 80s, early 90s, where gun violence was at, at record numbers, right? 2000, over 2,000 people were being murdered in New York City in the early 90s. Um, so I grew up around a lot of gun violence. And then, of course, Unfortunately, like my crime is related to guns and gun violence and the loss of life, the loss of um, the feeling of safety for those people who were in the vicinity mm -hmm. when it happened. Um, uh, and, and, and then coming home, though the neighborhood wasn't exactly like how I left it, it was still the same in the eyes of many of the folks that were living there and still is to this day. So it just felt, I felt like it was, it was, it was necessary for me to be a part of this. I always call it people work. Um, and, you know, gun violence is just like the evident display of so many other things that's happening on the undercurrent. Um, and I want to sort of be able to bring my experiences, but my expertise also to the conversation. Um, and I've been doing this since I've been home. Yeah. You've said that gun violence can be treated in a way comparable to an infectious disease. Um, yeah. Can you explain that? Well, it's, you know, it's, this is, that's not necessarily my sort of theory, but it's something I do adhere to where um, there are folks who um, take a public health approach to addressing gun violence, seeing it as a disease that's sort of like transmitted in terms of the behavior, mm -hmm. the behaviors that sort of go along with somebody feeling the need to pick up a weapon. Um, it's a public health approach to addressing gun violence. And, um, there are many organizations that do this sort of work. Um, one nationally known is called Cure Violence, mm -hmm. where they have a public health approach. And they, pretty much the people that work are the folks who, who were once infected, you can say, mm -hmm. people who are credible messengers, people who were once engaged in that lifestyle at some point. Um, so that's sort of the school I've come out from. And then the work that I'm doing with the Soros Fellowship, um, and as I said, there's two components usually to public health approaches. One is a behavioral change, and the other one is empowerment. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the folks that are doing the work around cure violence are doing a great job of the behavioral change. I want to be able to see, to explore how we can not only build, empower our community, uh, give our community autonomy to create mm -hmm. the necessary, what they want in their neighborhoods, not just stopping it, but what do we want there now? Well, I want to come back to that, but I can't let the question of infection and um, gun violence go without commenting that it seems to me the most horribly addicted entity in the world is the U.S. Pentagon, is the U.S. military. Uh, sure, let's mm -hmm. help kids in your neighborhood, but 
What do we do about society, our society's addiction to picking up a gun to solve every problem in this country, everywhere? Well, I think particularly in this country, there's a, there's a sort of warped um, addiction love of guns that are, that are sort of, I could say, bastardized from the original way when we think about the Second Amendment, et cetera. Um, but in terms of what we do about it, there's a couple of things. One there is isn't that, a problem in the world that we don't think we can send troops to solve. Right. I mean, that's how we feel. That's how we address We see everything as a nail, so we, we use a hammer every time. So that's modeled in our communities, right? And that's why my project with the Soros Fellowship is why, you know, once we're able to, you know, explore and see how the community can create what they want, we want the police to respect that also and not be in those spaces with the guns. The mayor just um, hired 1,300 new police officers here in New York. They only asked for 1,000. I don't know how it got to be 1,300. If you were mayor, um, <laughs> is that me. what you would have done? <laughs> and what would you do with those 1,300 now you've got them? We always add more police officers, whether crime is reduced or crime is up, right? So I think it's a conversation is policing, or when we, do we view policing as a way to sort of um, create the community we want, or is it a job production sort of mechanism? Do you relate to the Black Lives Matter movement? Yeah, and definitely. What you do and how? Well, because I th it's, it's a cry. I think the mere fact we, there are folks who have to say that, like I matter. That means there's inherently something that's telling you that I'm not. So I have to tell you that. I shouldn't have to tell you that I matter. Um, and when we think about gun violence, folks don't wake up and say, I want to shoot people. Gun shooters, shooters aren't born, right. right? There's something that tells them, there's something that's conditioned into them, sort of even an ingrained sort of sense of hopelessness that makes them see less value in themselves. And if I see less value in me, it's much easier for me to yeah. see less value in you. Um, and that's extending the Black Lives conversation, the Black Lives Matter conversation, um, not only to the realm of police and state violence, which is a huge model for why we, uh, a reason for why we in many cases see no value in ourselves because the people who are to protect us devalue mm. us. One response to the devaluation of black life, black male life, um, is the Million Man March that's mm -hmm. uh, happening again this fall, 10 years after it happened last time, or even more. Mm -hmm. um, will you be going? How do you? Re no. Um, I remember getting a text message about this about a year and a half ago. Um, and I said to the person, no, I'm not involved with it. I'm not getting involved with this. We, we, we're missing the point. Um, when we think about the Million Man March and we think about our communities, right? A community is in, it includes everybody within our communities in terms of men, women, gay, lesbian, transgender, et cetera, within our communities. The Million Man March sort of comes from the premise that we need to empower our men first and then like everybody else will follow. And I don't know if that's logical, right? Just think about it. If, if when we thought about the eradication or abolishment of slavery, did they say, well, we're going to free the men first and the women are going to come along next? We kind of did say that. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> At least on voting. <laughs> uh, but, vote, but that's the next part I was going to yeah. go to, right? Um, we didn't say that. Um, we said that we need to free everybody, at least from the chains yeah. of slavery. Yeah. It just made sense. We have a community of folks that are, that, are, that, are, that are oppressing the system of slavery. We have a community of folks that are oppressed in many ways in, in black and brown communities by different state systems in different ways. We can't think that we can um, empower them in these communities by saying we're just going to empower the men in the communities because we're just sort of um, we're just sort of extending, reflecting, mirroring the sort of patriarchal framework that says that um, men are front and women are second, and that that's, that's not what we need. That's not where we're at. It's not what real racial justice looks like. If, a, if that's a tenant of the Million Man March, it's not what true community empowerment looks like if that is another tenant of the Million Man March. Marlon, I've got one last question. Thank you so much for coming in. It's been great to be with you. You've been through a lot and you've taken a, you've taken t a lot of responsibility for everything you've done, but you've also talked about the big structural underpinnings of the situation in which you found yourself. Ta-Nehisi Coates, writing recently, talked about forgiveness and his attitude towards the Charleston families who forgave uh, accused shooter Dylan Roof um, after that massacre in the Charleston church. Coates said to him forgiveness was kind of aspirational. He would like to get there, but he's not sure he actually is there. Um, how do you think about forgiveness? I think forgiveness, particularly in that conversation, it's, it's skewed in terms of how it's applied. Um, I think about, as that was happening in Charleston with um, uh, uh, Dylan Roof uh, in, in, in Boston, Sarnayev, similarly young boy who was influenced, um, 
was everyone was shooting for this guy to be, no pun intended, to get the death penalty, yeah. which he eventually got. And there was no huge conversations about forgiveness around this, around that young boy, around that young man. Bringing back the, the conversation around Black Lives Matter, um, I think um, there's a level of how we view certain life in this country, in this nation historically. Um, and uh, we view certain, certain folks, white folks particularly in this country in a different sort of way, value it more than black lives. So, you know, um, and, and, that's, and that becomes inherent in us, right? Inherent in black folks. Black folks tend to look at white folks a little bit higher than they would look at other black, the, uh, folks of their own So it's the way we wage wars around the world to keep things safe at home. And, and I think that, I think it's okay to forgive folks. And I think if somebody can find it in their heart to forgive him, I think they should. But we need to be able to do that around the board, right? The nation has been pushing people to forgive that young man. We have not been pushing people to forgive um, other folks who committed similarly atrocious, uh, similar atrocities. And I just also want to add that, I mean, I'm a person who, I mean, I know to this day, and I say I know to this day, there are people in this world that probably hear my name and curse it. Mm -hmm. I'm very, I, I understand that, and I respect that. Um, and I hope that they could forgive me. I would want it that they would be able to forgive me, even though I didn't. I was just in the vicinity of the of the shooting. I was associated. My name is associated, and will forever be associated with it, which sort of drives my work. Um, so I believe in forgiveness. I would want it, somebody. I would want folks to forgive me as well. And I think that person, if we're thinking about a restorative model of justice, like that person, Dylan Roof, at some point people can forgive him. But I don't know about right now. I don't think that I can have my mother killed today and forgive you tomorrow. I don't think that's logical. I don't think that is healthy. Thanks so much, Marlon. Great yeah. to have you. Thanks Thank for you. coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Mm -hmm. You can find out more about all the things we've talked about with Marlon Peterson and more about him and his writings at our website. Jeff Chang is one of America's leading historians and cultural critics, the author of Can't Stop, Won't Stop, a hit history of hip hop. He's the author most recently of Who We Be, The Colorization of America. I had a chance to catch up with him this summer in New York, not so long after the Charleston shootings. In a lot of ways, a lot of things have changed in this country for racial equality and, and cultural equity. I mean, we can, we can watch Empire and Blackish and Fresh Off the Boat now on weekdays in prime time um, and uh, certainly musically um, mainstream culture all of that kind of stuff uh, we see sort of this happy rainbow country but at the same time the regime sort of of color blindness what I mean by that is is the refusal of folks in the US to see what it is that we are doing around race um, recreates these structures of segregation, um, recreates these structures of inequality. Our refusal to see these things has uh, created a situation in which by all social indices, you know, the gaps are opening on income, on wealth, on educational attainment, on housing. Um, people talk a lot about gentrification um, and at the same time um, what we see is these flashpoints are happening in these suburban areas uh, of these big cities. Um, well, actually gentrification is part of the same larger resegregation process that produces a Ferguson, that produces a Sanford, uh, Florida, that produces uh, West Baltimore, right? And, um, and yet we refuse to see these things. The book was really looking at, uh, literally, um, visual culture over the last 50 years and how artists have tried to uh, raise these questions uh, from the 60s all the way up till now. Um, and what's been really interesting is to see the rise now of these social movements that are literally about transforming the way that we see each other. Uh, understanding that racial profiling um, and the stereotypes and the kinds of things, these kinds of ways that prevent us from seeing each other's full humanity um, are what is triggering, uh, continuing to trigger uh, these these sparks, these flashpoints, these events, um, uh, these killings, um, these assaults, this violence uh, that the Black Lives Matter movement has has uh, sprung up to call attention to, and and to move us towards um, transforming. One of the things that I find really exciting about the Black Lives Matter movement is it's not just about uh, this sort of dichotomy of, of, of um, 
of blindness and and seeing that is just about um, uh, transforming what what's happening in the media, for instance, right? Um, it's about seeing the whole diversity of Black Lives, and what I think Black Lives Matter, uh, what folks in Black Lives Matter uh, argue is that if we can see the diversity of Black Lives. Uh, and why they matter, then we can see why all lives uh, matter. We're in this weird kind of moment now where everybody's kind of looking for diversity. Diversity is kind of a fad right now. Um, and I think that that provides openings for folks to be able to find their way in. We've already seen artists like Kendrick Lamar, like D'Angelo, like Kamasi Washington, um, being able to, to step into that space and be able to articulate um, what even two or three years ago might have been really radical, two radical messages um, for, for the marketplace. Culture is implicated in, in capitalism um, intimately in, in both the sort of ideological form that Nancy Leon calls racial capitalism um, as well as actual factual capitalism. Cultures really uh, always had to figure out, people working in the culture of always I think had to figure out where you want to align yourself in relationship to that. Um, and you know, arts arts not easy, and art needs funding, and we all need patrons, and and you know, and so it's the kind of thing where uh, uh, the economies, uh, the questions of the economies of of the arts are are uh, are always before us. That was art historian and social critic Jeff Chang talking with me earlier this year. For a whole lot more on the Black Lives Matter movement, check out our website. The state of California agreed in early September to overhaul its solitary confinement system, with some 3,000 living and breathing people locked up, some of them for 20 or 30 years in small cells without windows, all but two hours a day. You can bet that system needs overhauling. It actually needs abolishing, as does our mass incarceration system more generally. I know talk of prison abolition is rarely heard in public, but that doesn't mean that plenty of people aren't talking about it. Oakland-based critical resistance is just one example, and they're not alone, not now and certainly not in U.S. history. The U.S. is an outlier in the so-called civilized world when it comes to writing people off and locking them away. But we've only done it for two misbegotten centuries. Go back 200 years and you'll find plenty of debate. Colonial jails were tiny wooden buildings like the one that's still standing on Cape Cod has been there since 1690. It housed people only until they were tried. Incarceration as a punishment only came later. Solitary, ironically, was the brainchild of the Quakers, the very same people who pushed to abolish slavery. They imagined that reflection all alone was an alternative that was more liberal to the stocks and whipping. Even at that time, though, there were places with no prisons. When Pope Francis passes through Central Park this year, he'll pass the site of Seneca Village, a village settled by free blacks and Irish immigrants in the 1820s. According to the New York Historical Society, Seneca Village held three churches, a school, several cemeteries, but no prison, until it was raised to build the park. After the Civil War, those hundreds of towns founded by freed slaves had schools and churches and even music halls, but no prisons. Anthropologist and novelist Zora Neale Hurston described one of them, Eatonville, Florida, where she grew up, as a, quote, city of five lakes, three croquet courts, 300 black skins, 300 good swimmers, plenty of guavas, two schools, and no jailhouse. Abolition may not be as American as apple pie, but it's certainly not a foreign concept, and it's been around a whole lot longer than the prison industrial complex. To tell me what you think, write to me, Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at grittv.org, and thanks.
black land matters this week on the Laura Flanders show. There's always been a backstory of mm. cooperative financial movements behind those social movements. And then we take a look at a few initiatives to do that again today. What this workshop does specifically in breaking down what a cooperative does is empowers people. That is where I kind of lay most of my hope for, for change in this neighborhood. What does it take to go from a moment to a movement? Today we're dedicating the entire Laura Flanders show to a special report from Baltimore. People in Baltimore are tired of just sitting idle waiting for change to happen, so we're going to make change happen ourselves. Whether it's through breaking the curfew, civil disobedience, or daily protest, whatever it is, we're going to do it. <laughs> 